Whenever I tell people that I'm doing a PhD on comics, they say, wow, that's super cool. And I say, I know, I love it too. The combination of art and prose, obviously superheroes, numerous comics creators with unique and different styles, all of that's great. But if you wish to do a PhD on comics, you have to ask questions like, yeah, comics are cool, but so what? Or how can we do academic work on comics? And I ask those questions to myself, and I'd like to share my answers with you today. But before we get going, quick poll on your favorite superhero. So raise hands for Black Panther. How about Wonder Woman? OK. Superman? And Batman? All right. I see Batman's the winner. Well, superhero comics is not everyone's cup of kryptonite, but everyone kind of has a favorite superhero. Personally, I'm a fan of Batman, not only for the characterization and the aesthetically pleasing aspect of the Cape Crusader, but also for the rich narrative that the Batman universe offers. So, sorry for the fans of other superheroes, but today I'll be talking mostly about Batman. <laughs> Virtually all Batman or other superhero fans have their favorite storyline or their favorite comics creator. For me, what specifically drew both my readerly and academic attention towards the Batman franchise was the 1980s revisionary Batman stories. So today, I'll tell you why those revisionary stories were so special, as well as why Batman comics are worth a TED talk, and most important of all, why you should reconsider the way you look at comics. What I and multiple other comic scholars found so unique about those 1980s revisionary comics was a clear transition from a four decade long tradition of repetitive plots in which Batman slaps or flying kicks a villain per issue to a relatively darker, more realistic depictions of the new, self-conflicted, cynical, and in a way narcissistic Batman. The most famous of those revisionary stories were, of course, The Dark Knight Returns, Year One, The Killing Joke. By the way, Joker fans, this is, I think, the best Joker story ever. So if you haven't read it, do so. And finally, Arkham Asylum. So if you're a Batman fan, you might have heard or at least read one of those stories. And if you are new to comics, I highly recommend you to read at least one of them, and you'll thank me later. <laughs> So just by comparing the arts of the traditional Golden Age and Silver Age Batman to the new 1980s revisionary Batman, we can see a clear shift from cartoonish to realistic. So comics, just like movies, TV shows, or novels, can be serious too. By serious, I mean we can read comic books as socially responsible texts rather than just sheer entertainment. Let's take violence, for instance, and see what function comics may serve in that context. Regardless of the centuries-long progress in human civilization, I think we still partially remain savages. Even though the vast majority of human population still manages to cohabit in peace, violence virtually exists everywhere. As a cultural text, Batman Year One is the ultimate comic book through which we can understand how a comic book can tell more than just a fictional story. Raising the bet, I argue that, yes, comics reflect reality. Yes, comics creators intentionally or un unintentionally criticize social issues in their works. But what I claim is that the representation of any form of violence celebrates and glorifies it. And if you pay attention closely enough, we can see that Batman Year One presents those three layers of sociopolitical responsibility. But first, let me explain to you how a comic book can reflect reality in a superhero comic book way. If we pay attention to the events portrayed in Batman Year One, we can see that they are not that far off from the reality of its day. In particular, Issues related to policing are represented with remarkable accuracy. In this story, we get introduced to a widespread and systemic corruption within the Gotham City Police Department, including bribery to overlook drug trade, the blue wall of silence, meaning that the other officers were indifferent to corruption or any other type of misconduct, 
and of course the clandestine relationship among the city hall, police, and the crime world, namely the mafia. In retrospect, we see very similar instances occur in the 70s and 80s United States. Knapp and Mullen commissions found widespread and systemic corruption within the New York City Police Department. The code of silence was and still is a major issue within the discourse of corruption of authority. And of course, the Alta Donna luncheon, the scandal meeting between the local government officials, high-ranking police officers, and an allegedly crime family member. And if these are not convincing for you, let me introduce to you Frank Serpico. Frank Serpico was a former New York Police Department police officer who adamantly fought against police corruption. You might be familiar with Frank Serpico if you watched the documentary called, well, Serpico. <laughs> In Batman Year One, James Gordon's storyline is strikingly reminiscent of Frank Serpico's battle against corruption. And besides corruption, Batman Year One was also very accurate in depicting police militarization and police brutality. In the story, we see Detective Arnold Flass rounding up an African-American teenager in the middle of the street on no reasonable grounds. We can also see the Gotham City Police Department SWAT teams infiltrating abandoned buildings using military-grade weaponry and equipment. In short, they were just being SWAT teams. <laughs> Again, in retrospect, we see very, very similar instances occur. The Watts riots, the Waco incident, the LAPD and their famous rescue vehicle. So seeing all this accuracy, we can now return to the question, so what? Do these images and stories mean that they were a criticism of reality? Well, not always, but sometimes yes. Frank Miller, the author of Batman Year One and The Dark Knight Returns, says in an interview that the world that we live in does not resemble the world of the senses. I simply put Batman, this unearthly force, into a world that's closer to the one I know. And the world I know is terrifying. So some comics creators like Frank Miller did not live in this world of fantasy, of superheroes and alternative universes. In one way or another, they wrote about the world that we live in. And if you want to extend your readership outside the superhero genre, you have invaluable texts such as the DMZ, The Massive, The Seeds, Stuck Rubber Baby, and many more, which are socially responsible. Finally, to add kryptonite to injury, besides the representation and criticism of social issues, I think comics might be glorifying and celebrating violence. Let us remember, that comics is an ever-expanding industry. Naturally, what readers enjoy reading more tends to proliferate in the market. So the more violent theme stories gain popularity, the more they are likely to increase in number. So can we, as the comics readers, actually be the passive and silent enjoyers of violence? Just like the millions of us who watch the news of a beating, a shooting, or war, and go, yeah, too bad, but what can we do? It is what it is. Next time you read a comic book, you can look closely to find traces of reality, especially of social issues. So the superpower of comics is that it shows us what we, as humans, might be doing really wrong. Thank you.